13. It's printed there in your bulletin insert, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to just kind of give us some of the highlights, but I would ask you this week to take some time to read the entire chapter 13 of Genesis. See, in this chapter, Abram, his family, and Lot's family are returning from Egypt. And the writer of Genesis tells us that Abram's family was rich, that he had livestock, and that he had silver, and that he had gold. And we also learn that his nephew Lot must have been doing okay as well. And so they end up near Bethel. Now, if you were here last week, Bethel should ring a, a bell because that's where we left them last week before they went down to Egypt. And at Bethel, Abram calls on the name of the Lord. He's thanking God for providing for them for him. He's probably also thanking God for saving him from disaster from his bad decisions in Egypt. But with their wealth, the flocks of Abram and Lot have gotten large, and they've gotten so large that the land cannot support all their herds. And on top of that, we're told that there's Canaanites and Perizzites in the land as well. It's, it's actually Perizzites. It's not parasites, even though they might have acted like parasites. But there's pressure on the grazing land. If you look at verse 7, it says, There was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdmen, herdsmen of Lot's, Lot's livestock. They were literally fighting over the turf, the land that they needed for grazing their animals. And with trouble brewing between Abram's and Lot's people, we come to the first step that we should take when facing family turf troubles. And that is to seek peace. Look at verse 8 there with me. Abram says to his nephew Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we're kinsmen, for we're family. Is this not the whole, is not the whole land before you? And so separate yourself from me. Abram is using very basic but very godly wisdom here. When there's a problem in the family, the first thing we should do is to seek peace. In Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 14, Paul said, let us pursue what makes for peace. In Romans 12, Paul wrote, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul wrote to his protege, Timothy, in a letter, and he says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. I happen to know two very godly men who are extremely passionate in their faith. Both of these guys love Jesus and they're, they're driven to serve the Lord. And yet these two guys can get into some very heated discussions with each other. The, the turf that they frequently argue about is how their ideas on how to best move the church forward. And the fact of the matter is these two guys can bring out the worst in each other. But the good news is, is that they love and respect each other deeply. And so what typically happens after they have one of their heated discussions is the next day one of them will text or call the other and say something like this, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I'm an idiot. And to that the other one who will reply, I'm sorry too, forgive me too, and no, you're not an idiot, I'm actually the one who's the idiot. And in the end, they agree that both of them are idiots. They're idiots who love Jesus. And to settle their differences, all that is needed is for one of them to take that first step toward peace. And I think there's some very practical wisdom here. It takes two people to argue. It takes one person to begin the road to peace. In the turf trouble over the grazing land, Abram took that first step toward peace. 